Hi, and welcome back to U.S. History with me, Mr. Snyder, and today we're finally going to begin our unit over World War I and how that changes the U.S. position in the world. Learning targets today are to talk about the causes about the entire war and why it happened. We'll talk about the new weapons uh, and talk about trench warfare and the stalemate that it caused. We'll talk about the reasons why the United States does not get involved until the very end and why we enter on the side of the Allies. So four different things uh, caused World War I. Nationalism, imperialism, militarism, and the alliance system. So nationalism is the devotion to your country. There's an intense period of nationalism going on in Europe because they reject the idea that many different ethnicities can make up one nation. They think one nation should contain one ethnic group. And these evolving beliefs lead to an intense nationalism around the beginning of the century. For example, France longs to reclaim its um, Alsace-Lorraine uh, piece of land, which is a strip of land it lost to Germany in a previous war. French people live there. They believe that they should own that land. Imperialism is, we've talked about imperialism for the last unit, but in competing countries um, want these lands that have that are rich in raw materials, and they'll go to war over these lands that are rich and have long, raw materials, as we saw in the Spanish-American War. Britain and France already have these large empires around the world, but Germany, Italy, Belgium, Japan, and the United States are all racing to carve out these colonies in different areas like China, Africa, and other Pacific nations like the Philippines. And then finally, militarism. It, Countries begin placing more of an emphasis on their military and glorifying the military, and that's what militarism means. Germany has the largest uh, army, and Britain has the largest navy, although France and Russia also have large militaries. And this increasing feeling of militarism makes these countries increase their military size. That means this upcoming war will have more troops and more techno uh, technologically advanced weapons than ever before. Machine guns, mobile artillery, tanks, submarines, and airplanes will all be used for the first time. Here you can see the military strength of each country, each major player in the um, World War I. And the United States at the beginning is very, very outmatched, even though we do have a um, rather sizable navy. Finally, the alliance system. Basically, these countries make treaties with one another to back each other up if they ever get into conflict with another country. And so that means that they can begin acting recklessly because their friends will back them up and no one in an alliance wants to look like the unreliable country. So Germany, Austria, Hungary, Italy, and the Ottoman Empire form the Triple Alliance, also known as the Central Powers. France, Russia, and Great Britain are the major countries that form the Triple Entente. And you can remember that because France... Uh, uh, Entente is a French word, and France is in the Triple Entente, or the Allied Powers. And these are the two major groups that will go to war with one another in World War I. And here is the triggering point that sets everything off. Uh, um, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, or known as Francis Ferdinand uh, in America, was the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, a very powerful country, kind of on its way down. But they make a trip to Sarajevo, which is the capital city of the pro province of Bosnia. A few ethnic Serbs from neighboring Serbia, which are friends with the Triple Entente, feel that Bosnia belongs to their ethnic group and not Austria-Hungary. Again, uh, that feeling of nationalism. And in, during the visit, they assassinate Ferdinand and his wife. And this triggers Austria-Hungary to declare war on Serbia, and it drags their friends into it as well. Germany says that to Austria-Hungary that they would fight with them if war ensues. And eventually, everyone declares war on everyone else within the week, and we are fighting. Germany declares war against neutral Belgium to launch an invasion against France. And here you can see the Western Front on the left, the Eastern Front on the right, uh, the different, the purple are the Central Powers, and the Allies Powers are in the um, orange. And you can see most of the fighting does take place in France on the uh, French-Belgium 
border. During the course of this great war, trenches are dug along the French, Belgium, and German border. Like I said, the Western Front is the main battlefield. People stand in these trenches, and their goal is to take the trench across from them, from their enemy, and make their enemy retreat. People get disease and die, and trench foot, which literally is bacteria that eats away at their feet from these wet and muddy trenches. No man's land is the area between the each tre uh, two trenches with barbed wire and basically just hell on earth because there it's been mortared to death and artillery has carved out all the trees and it looks horrible. Uh, the new technology kills many men. Uh, you can have one man on a machine gun now kill hundreds of approaching men. And so this is basically just a slaughter because these defensive weapons are so good. The result of this trench warfare is a, it turns into a war of attrition, which basically means who can last longer. And that means that we have a stalemate going on. There's millions of casualties from this war. And casualty means a soldier that is killed, wounded, or missing in action. Here's some more new weaponry. We talked about machine guns. These long-range cannons uh, are called artillery field guns. They're pulled around by horses during this. Uh, poison gas, which is now outlawed by international war, uh, causes uh, people to basically eat them. It eats their lungs, basically, and melts them. Uh, submarines use torpedoes as well as on-deck guns to attack ships. Tanks and armored cars and airplanes are mostly used for reconnaissance, but we could take a bomb up for us uh, with us and try to drop it on something. They're not a very decisive weapon until World War II. America, how do we get involved in this? Well, President Wilson doesn't want to get involved. Too many immigrants in America would mean that we'd have different factions at war and disagreements going on with one another in our country. Most people want to maintain direct isolation from these European disputes because it doesn't affect them. However, businesses in America are doing very well because they're benefiting from selling goods to the warring nations. Um, most immigrants feel that the central powers actions are justified. Irish Americans don't like Great Britain because they've dominated their homeland for centuries. Jewish Americans hope for Russia's defeat because they had immigrated from Russia to America to escape the Tsar's murderous programs for Jews, and obviously German Americans are on the side of the Germans. But most Americans do side with Britain and France due to our historic ties with each. Um, we obviously come from Great Britain, and France, um, France helped us during the Revolutionary War. So should the U.S. intervene, three groups of people solidify their opinions. People who say yes want to intervene. They're called interventionists. And the war affects American ties with Britain and France, so we should intervene on the side of the Allies. Those people who say we should not get involved are called isolationists. They say it's none of America's business. We should stay isolated from these horrible hostilities. Why subject our American men to this? And the people who want to intervene on a limited basis, like Woodrow Wilson, are called internationalists. They want to play an active role to bring peace to the situation, but they do not want to enter the war themselves. But eventually the U.S. does get dragged into the conflict, and Britain begins to use their navy to blockade German ports and confiscate what are called contraband goods, which are weapons and other supplies used to fight a war. But uh, Germany goes ahead and uses its submarines, called U-boats, to blockade Britain and sink a whole bunch of Allied ships. And they also sink the Lusitania, which is a British passenger ship that was carrying Americans because it was carrying weapons as well. So they had every right to do it, but 1,200 people died. We're upset about it. Germany then makes promises to end sinking unarmed passenger ships. Uh, in 1916, they do it again by sinking a something called the Sussex. And so the, Sus, uh, the Sussex Pledge is when Germany pledges again not to sink any unarmed ships, but it doesn't last for long. While this is going on, the U.S. begins to become prepared for war by passing the National Defense Act, which expands the size of the Army, and the Naval Construction Act, which orders more warships to be built. 
During this time, Wilson wins re-election in 1916 by uh, the slogan, he kept us out of war. But that won't happen for much longer because Germany, for basically two reasons, Germany once again institutes unrestricted warfare on British ships. And we find that the German foreign minister has been talking with Mexico saying, hey, Mexico, if you join on the side of the central powers, we'll give you back Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona after Germany wins. So this Zimmer, uh, Zimmerman note is intercepted by the British and shown to the United States. Mexico really wasn't going to attack the United States. They had no intentions. They have a small military. But basically, we can't take this sitting down anymore. So no longer to keep the country out of war. Wilson asks Congress for a declaration of war against Germany. And that is where we'll leave off for the day. Maybe not. Here is a final uh, look at the causes of the war, the nature of the war, and the reasons for U.S. involvement. But I'll let you take a look at this for yourself. Uh, if you have any questions, please bring them back to class, and I will see you then. Bye-bye.